you heard about me. And we want to warn you that this next segment is for mature audiences. Our live and direct investigation into illegal prostitution. A few weeks ago, we took you behind the scenes at the Moonlight Bunny Ranch, a legal brothel outside of Carson City, Nevada. Nevada is a state where in some areas, selling sex is legal at licensed brothels, like the Bunny Ranch, which we visited. Well, tonight, we show you an inside look at the other side of sex for sale in the U.S., the underground world of illegal prostitution. This is as dangerous and desperate as it gets, yet despite its risk, by most estimates, prostitution is a multi-billion dollar a year business. That's my right hand and one of my working girls on their way to come see us. It is estimated that there are more than one million women and girls working as prostitutes in the U.S. today. It's like a candy store, you know. I want the red one, I want the blue one, I want the green one. You can go to practically any city in the country and the scene will be the same. What are you doing? For the money. At corners and in doorways at red light districts, suggestively dressed prostitutes advertise their wares. How do you feel about being sold for sex? I don't like doing it, but it's just something I have to do. In most cities, the practice is illegal, but definitely not invisible. My first night, I was only out there two hours, and I made 600. A thousand, maybe 1,200. 16, 1,700 at the most. Like any business, it's driven by cash. They pay, you know, from 150, 200, 300, 400, 500, and it goes up. They for an hour? It, for an hour, for an hour, How or, or until they get off. And the ones managing and protecting the ladies of the night, not to mention the money of prostitution, are the pimps. There's nothing like hold dog. There's nothing like it. San Francisco has been a magnet for the sex industry for years. And that's where we met two of the Bay Area's most notorious and successful pimps, known on the streets of San Fran as Money Banks and Gangster Brown. He is a conservative business player. I am a guerrilla killer player. And their cars certainly reflect their images, too. Money Banks drives a new Mercedes. Gangster Brown tools around in a pimped out GMC Savannah tour van. He calls it his hoe buggy. It's with the girls riding in Savannah van. Pimps call themselves Max or players in the game. The game of selling sex. Gangster Brown played it big time for 31 years. Money Banks for 20. Both say they are now retired from the game. 31 years of evading the law. Their job was to catch me. My job was to get away. Because I'm the teacher now. I mean, I'm not doing it. I do it because I have to, because I'm the only one left. The guys that last in their spinners is the guys that's fair, and the guys that's looking for a future. You're in this game to get in to invest and get out. Gangster Brown and Money Banks have been friends since childhood. Gangster learned the sex trade as a teenager from a legendary San Francisco pimp named Fillmore Slim. Money Banks, in turn, learned the game from who else? Gangster Brown. And while you might not recognize their names, you may know the name of their most famous employee, Divine Brown, the West Hollywood street hooker who in 1995 was arrested along with actor Hugh Grant for getting caught in the act on Sunset Strip. Money and Gangsta say they scored big time with her sudden fame. Uh, Divine Brown in one, in one month gave me one million. So no player can top that. Pimping ain't easy, but somebody gotta do it. We began our investigation into their world of prostitution across the Bay Bridge in Oakland, California. That's where Gangsta Brown cut his teeth in the business. Ghetto pimping, he calls it, on this street known as Hose Row. Let me tell you how it works. You set your feet mirror right here on International Boulevard. And somebody come by that might like her, pull over, quote a price, and have a small date for a small 15, 20 minutes. Gangsta also showed us the old neighborhood where girls in danger still lurk around dark corners and dark sidewalks. And these youngsters here is harassing somebody's money. The girl's trying to make money. You got one gentleman hollering over here. And all they do is just talk, interfering. 
Now, she walked away from them. She didn't give them no rhythm. So now they need to leave her alone so she can get what she come out here to do. Well, that's why I try to tell all of them, you know, get your education. Get off the streets. It's dangerous. The laws is tough now. You know, I don't condone what they do. I did it because I had to. That's a young lady of leisure right there. That's a minor. She shouldn't be out here. While Gangster did his pimping with street girls, Money Banks, with the help of three cell phones, opted for the on-call service. Hey, Brian, I'm going to go down to the hotel real quick because I got I got some moves to make. Let's go down there, man. I got to get my money on, man. He introduced us to Sparkle, a call girl who says she's 21 and began hustling at the age of 13. And sometimes you can get scared out of the game. Sometimes you can just be hard in the game. But the money is right, so, you know, I probably, I could do this for a long time. Even though Money Banks claims he's retired, on this night, he delivered Sparkle to an Oakland hotel to turn a trick. She was upstairs for 30 minutes. She's handling, she's working her, you know, she's working her little deal. You know, whatever she gonna get, she gonna get. But I'm telling her right now, take everything, take anything you can get. Just finish, just hurry up, baby, just hurry up. Sparkle would eventually come out of the hotel with what she said was a few hundred dollars in her pocket. The following night, Money Banks and Gangster Brown took us to the San Francisco neighborhood where pimps made the big bucks on Polk and O'Farrell streets near the seedy Tenderloin District. It became obvious early on that Gangster Brown was a local celebrity. Ain't here about eight or nine homes, pimping out a limousine when I was about 13 or 14. I wanted to be like this man. Who are the customers? Who are the Johns? It is the American doctor, dentist, lawyer, corporate people. We don't understand why they're so hard on us because we are providing happiness for a man. We're not killing him, we're not robbing him. Are some of your customers married? Yes. Yes. All of them. All of them? Yes. They all are married. They love their wife, but they don't want to see him. They want some action. They want to go to a strip club. They see some fine, tight, nice bodies with that ass coming out. Oh, my God. Man. Yes. And then they yes. get a taste of that. When they go home that night, after being with that young lady, what are some of the worst things you guys have seen? A lot of things happen when a woman really don't follow her man's program. Getting in the car, um, not really letting somebody know what cars, jumping in and out of cars, not being cautious, driving off, and we really not knowing where she's going because she don't tell us the license plate, where she's going to check in. She thinks she can make a run and come back, and sometimes they don't come back. What yeah. happens to them then? They come up dead, come up raped, come up with their arm and leg cut off. Do you feel responsible? Don't you feel bad about what's happening to these women? Yes. Mostly for me, I haven't had a lot of bad experience because one thing I was fortunate, they listened and they took what I said and heed and paid attention and made it to come out better for me where I never had them worries. You know, we would check in when you get there. Let me know what room, what kind of car. And so the average female that listens, drug free one, focus, then it comes out way, way, way better, way better. Incredible to see. Well, life on the street has been good for the men, as you can see, but is it good for the women who are the ones doing the dirty work? Up next, the prostitute story. How do they fall into life on the streets, risking rape and even murder?